So, what's your favorite movie? It's one of those standard let's get to know each other questions. It was never intended to be overthought, I think, but honestly I always struggle with the answer. It's not because I don't know what to say, I do, very clearly. I have two favorite productions. One of them is the Lord of the Rings trilogy and the other... Disney's 2003 Brother Bear. Um, yeah, I know what a combination, right? And while lots of people love Lord of the Rings, Brother Bear for some reason is looked down on as common Disney trash. And so it's been bugging me. Is something wrong with me? Why do people dislike it so much? And more importantly, what makes me love it so much? So today I decided to explore these exact questions and you're welcome to join me on my journey. Brother Bear opens up in the darkness. There where it all started, really. Us mere humans surrounded by an unknown, unfriendly world, trying to understand how everything around us works. And there we have it, the first figure that brings light into the space and who will metaphorically bring the light of knowledge and wisdom into our lives. Tanahi, the village elder. You know, nowadays we might not have village elders like that, but the action of gathering in the darkness to hear a story is something we still do, be it in the movie theater or at someone's home or even just on the beach near a campfire. Have you ever wondered why exactly in the darkness? Why doesn't daylight chit chat feel the same? Well, here's my personal theory. There is something alluring in the darkness. The concrete rational world melts away. We no longer see each other's faces clearly. Neither do we see the objects around us. Failed by the dusk, we can allow ourselves to suspend disbelief and let our imagination run wild and be more vulnerable. Nobody's going to see your glistening tears, and nobody's going to notice how engulfed you are in the story. You can allow yourself to feel and not overthink how the others perceive you. Such is the setting when Tanahi starts telling the tale to the people around him. Tanahi tells us and his audience of times long ago when the world was full of magic. The source of this magic being the spirits who roam as dancing lights on the night sky and bring upon change into the human realm. Small things become big. One thing always changes into another. Everything is constantly changing. We may not actively think about it, but every day we are in constant state of change. It actually can be divided in three pretty simple stages. Beginning, transition, and end. Here, I'll give you a basic example. Beginning would be you at home hungry. Then transition is you going to the market to buy snacks. And the end is you being back at home with a full stomach. Of course, not all changes are of the same significance. For example, you probably don't celebrate all of your successful returns from the supermarket, but you most likely acknowledge your birthday every year. However, there is something common between all changes, no matter how big or small, and that's our perception of their transitional stage. I don't know if you noticed, but we as humans are quite fearful of the transitional period. To go back on my grocery shopping example, I haven't heard anyone tell me, hey, stay safe at home, but I have received my fair share of, have a safe trip, careful on the road, and that's understandable. Going out of the safety of your home brings a certain amount of variables that you're not in control of. Therefore, now you're in greater danger. And of course, this applies to more complex situations as well. Say the journey of a small child into adulthood. Which stage is most dangerous? The childhood, when the kid is under the protection and supervision of their parents. The adulthood, when the kid is now a grown person and can think for themselves and fend for themselves. Or the transitional teen years, when the kid has to figure themselves out on their own in the danger of the grown-up world. Brother Bear decides to tackle one of those important and dare I say dangerous transitions in a human's life, namely a boy's tumultuous journey into adulthood. 
After the setting is established, we are introduced to our protagonist, Kinai, and his two brothers, Sitka and Tanahi. As I already mentioned, the conflict of the story revolves around this very pivotal part of Kinai's journey, but it's interesting to observe the figures around him as well. We don't get a lot of screen time with Sitka, but the movie does a great job at establishing him as this caring older brother. The first scene we see of him is when Kinai, you know, his childish wonder, has attempted to milk a caribou and is now running away from a whole scared herd, which puts both him and his brothers in a dangerous situation. After the danger has passed, Tanahi is naturally upset and gets into an argument with Kinai. And here we see Sitka's abilities shine. He gets a hold of his younger brothers, calming them and establishing a middle ground between the two. Growing up, of course I enjoyed the character of Kinai, after all he's the protagonist, but it was Sitka who I related more to. As an older sister myself, I could see my own struggles in Sitka's trying to balance being a figure of guidance and a sibling. As the oldest kid in a family, you naturally assume this almost parental role, and it could be really difficult drawing the line between your sense of responsibility and trying to enjoy yourself with your siblings and be a normal kid. And if you think about it, the movie goes even a step further and doesn't introduce any parents at all, so it's leaving us to wonder when did Sitka have to abandon his childhood and take on as the figure of guidance to his younger, more carefree brothers. After their little caribou argument is settled, the brothers go fishing and Kinai is the one in charge of tying the basket with the catch on a tree so a wild animal can't reach it. However, right at that time, the shaman woman has returned from the mountain with Kinai's totem that shall guide him into manhood. And so in his excitement, even though Kinai sees that the basket has fallen on the ground, he just decides to leave it there for later. The next scene shows the whole village has gathered to hear from the shaman. And here's a good time to add that the movie once again does a great job at portraying a character. I've watched the sacrilege called Brother Bear 2, which I refuse to acknowledge as canon only once. But what I remember as a distant feeling of it was that the shaman there was portrayed as a sort of a goofy caricature and she didn't have much integrity in my eyes. In Brother Bear 1, the contrary is true. You can tell by the people settling down in suspenseful awe in the mere presence of the shaman that this woman is well respected and that every word she says is treasure to be cherished. The shaman is that person who's constantly going into the position between the two worlds. People like that have great powers but also carry a pain that not every human can endure. Whether you agree or not from a religious standpoint with what a shaman does is um, irrelevant for this conversation because what matters here is that as a religious figure of guidance the shaman should portray a level of kindness and integrity so that we as audience understand why does a whole community hold him in such high regard. And that's something Brother Bear accomplishes quite well in my opinion and that's why I find it noteworthy. The shaman woman talks to the people of the great spirits and presents Kinai with his totem. In order to become a man, the shaman says, you must be guided by the bear, the totem of love. This upsets Kinai. You know his youthful, boyish excitement, he expected something like a totem for bravery, strength or greatness. Love just sounds kinda meek, you know? I've heard people call this fragile masculinity, but I feel like we can frame it in another way. I'll go into a bit of a speculative territory for a moment and see if you can follow my thought process. Okay, so Kinai is a young boy who wants to become a great man. Now, what kind of outward examples of successful manhood has he seen? Well, for one, he has his brother Sitka, who has the totem of guidance and embodies strength and a sort of level-headedness and the ability to have composure in tense situations. He also has seen one of the village men who we get introduced to in passing, and this guy has the totem of courage. People seem to feel happy and safe around him. So this is what Kinai has seen as an outward expression of manhood, and naturally this is what he wants to embody. If we think about it, this is fairly accurate portrayal of a lot of young men in today's society as well, looking to establish themselves and become providers or figures of guidance. But 
what some of them may not realize, and Kinai certainly didn't account for in this situation, is that the thing that fuels all this commendable societal rules is indeed love. What's the point of your courage if you don't have people who you love and want to protect? What's the point of your guidance if you don't have loved ones to guide? And what is the point of being a provider if you don't have loved ones to provide for? It is all meaningless and shallow without love and it won't bring you any genuine satisfaction. Love powers us all but it is something that is felt deep within one's soul. It's not something you could see or touch, it's something you need to experience. So naturally, Kinai as a hot-blooded teenager hasn't had the time to really think deeply about such things. They come with maturity. So, upset after the ceremony, with a wounded ego, Kinai approaches the tree where he dropped the fish and sees that a bear has eaten most of it and torn the basket. This, of course, creates a conflict between him and his brother because Tanahi doesn't want to make another basket. They take two weeks to make, that's a long time. And in this moment, Kinai has the opportunity to self-reflect and admit his mistake, but he has an already wounded ego, so he's clearly not thinking rationally and he refuses to take responsibility for the mistake and instead decides to go hunt the bear. We can assume that this is a way for him to prove something to himself. I can be like those brave warriors, I can go kill a bear, I can be a man. Again, what he fails to realize is that he's pushed by ego and selfishness and not by care to protect someone he loves. This is the point where his initiation journey begins. Kinai is about to enter the mountain and nothing will ever be as it was before. I don't know how you thought about it, but the mountain is a transitional space and that's why magic can happen there, because the line between our world and the world of the spirits is thinner there and wagon can travel back and forth, but that also does make it a dangerous space and we'll see how that plays out later. Kinai starts chasing after the bear, his brothers follow him and that's how all of them end up on a glacier. The situation getting worse by the second, the bear is cornered and angry, Tanaki is hanging by a thread in a gap between two glaciers and Kinai can barely hold him. The bear is slowly approaching them, Kinai can't reach for his weapon and he's trying to hold Tanaki and in that moment of desperation, Sitka does the biggest act of love to his younger brothers and breaks off the glacier. Falling down to his death, taking the bear with him into the icy abyss. I vividly remember seeing this scene as a kid. I didn't cry or anything, but I felt a gaping hole in my heart. This scene just made the story serious. It placed consequences on the table. I really appreciate that about older Disney. They weren't afraid to portray death and consequences. I don't know about the current kids, but for myself, I can say that it didn't traumatize me. It just felt real. Life is harsh like that. We are not the first humans to avoid it, so sheltering oneself from the reality just doesn't seem productive to me. Anyways, the brothers are devastated. We see them trying to find Sitka and then slowly coming to terms with the realization of his death. Well, not completely. Kina is still angry. Too much has happened to him all at once and he hasn't had the opportunity to process any of it. He doesn't see his fault in the situation, he hasn't realized what role his ego and pride had in all of this and so he just channels his anger towards the easiest target, the bear, who survived, while his brother didn't. Kinai asks Sanahi to join him on his revenge, but that just leads to another altercation between the two, where Tanahi makes it be known he blames Kinai for all that happened. Kinai, however, doesn't stop to self-reflect, he acts upon his most primal emotions and goes after the bear once more. This time, after an intense chasing, Kenai actually manages to kill the bear. This unjust death 
disrupts the natural balance. Kinai is taken up in the sky by the spirit of his brother and he gets turned into a bear. I've heard people criticizing the fact that Disney doesn't let people of color take up screen time as humans and instead turns them into animals and other stuff. And while I do think there is a case to be made for Soul and Princess and the Frog and others, I find the transformation in Brother Bear to be fitting for the environment and the context. Daughter Duckling, a kid turned into a deer, brothers turned into ravens. The idea of human transformation into animals is well known in the fairy tales of my country. But we are by far not the only ones. In Korea, during a ritual, some people say that the shaman can turn into a bird that connects our world with the ones of the gods. And in North America, people speak of a young hunter who left his tribe to go live with his buffalo wife and child, turning into a buffalo himself. There, you can also hear legends of ancestor bears and bear shapeshifters who'd mingle with the humans, creating a long-lasting bond between us and the natural world. The idea of humans turning into animals as a curse or as a form of connection with the wilderness is by far not a new concept. On the contrary, there is something so ancient in its essence. Kinai being turned into a bear in order to connect with what he fails to understand is but a natural part of his initiation journey. Kinai speaks to the shaman woman who tells him he needs to talk to his brother about the transformation and see if he can right his wrongs. Kinai still doesn't understand what he did wrong, but he has no choice. So without any direction, he starts walking through the forest. Eventually, he ends up meeting a little bear separated from his mother. Kinai doesn't like the cub at first, but as you can guess, the kid knows the way to the mountain where the spirits live, so Kinai has to learn to tolerate him. I've seen people brush over this part of the story as something they've seen before. A grumpy character who doesn't like the other grows to care for them. But there is a layer here that I find particularly interesting and I want to point your attention to. So far in the story, Kinai has been the youngest brother. Now the rules have changed and he's ended up in the position of the older brother, the one who has to come up with solutions when there seems to be an issue. Lost the hunter back under the glacier. So you don't think he'll follow those? I've got an idea. The one who has to make compromises and overcome his ego during an argument. Fine. Fine. Koda. This is not just a grumpy character who learns to tolerate another, this is a character transitioning into adulthood, learning how to take care of someone who needs their help. Another important aspect of Kinai's journey, and arguably the one that the movie hones in the most, is seeing the world through a different perspective and understanding the other. Kinai has all of his views about the natural world challenged. He didn't think of the bears as creatures who feel or think. I mean, a bear doesn't love anyone. They don't think. They don't feel. And he's surprised to find out that they have similar understanding of the world to his. Kinai's thoughts are reflective of our reality. We as humans constantly go through cycles of finding otherness, thinking we're better, and having to challenge our prejudice by the end of it. In other words, all of us go through a Kinai journey at some point in our lives. But since there are so many of us in this world and we go through life at our own individual pace or the pace of our community, we end up having to learn this lesson time and again, whether it be individually or as a society. And I believe we'll continue doing so for the years ahead. So no matter how cliche you think Kinai's thinking is, we as humans are just very cliche. Yes, we do have our free will and individuality, but we keep falling into the same behavioral patterns and that's just fascinating to observe. We simply can't escape our nature. It sometimes really feels like we're in a hamster wheel. It's so mind-boggling. But let's go back to Kinai. Every initiation journey is a symbolic death. You leave the past behind in order to embrace your new self. During some real-life initiation practices, teenage boys would stay sealed off into huts that symbolized the womb and their upcoming rebirth. They would also be put through various forms of pain and torture, symbolizing their death and preparing them for adulthood. 
Of course, Disney is no place for a series of a portrayal, but even so, the idea of death follows Kinai persistently throughout all of his journey in the face of none other than his brother, Tanahi. Tanahi doesn't know that Kinai was turned into a bear and thinks that the bear he's chasing is the original one that Kinai actually killed. For all he knows, he lost both of his brothers in the same day. His carefree youth was ripped away from him. The grief he's going through is immeasurable. In his own understanding, now he is the eldest one, but he doesn't even have a younger brother to protect. He has lost it all, haunted by his own last words to Kinai. I don't blame the bear, Kinai. He has nothing left but to avenge his brothers. He knows that the bear is not at fault, and this is not a revenge out of pride like Kinai's. This is a desperate attempt to fill the void the loss of his brothers has left in his life and to compensate for the guilt for his last argument with Kinai. Apart from symbolizing the imminent danger accompanying an initiation journey, Tanahi also provides an opportunity for Kinai to rethink his idea of good and evil. He knows his brother is not malicious at heart, and yet here he is chasing him mercilessly. Who's the villain? Who's the monster? And actually, is there one at all? This is the tragedy of Brother Bear. There is no real villain. There is just our nature, constantly flowing and changing its shape from evil to kind, from right to wrong. Eventually, Kinai and Koda the little bear reach the salmon run that's right next to the mountain where the lights touch the earth. Kinai is feeling uneasy amongst the other bears and he's ready to drop Koda off and continue on his journey, but his plans are delayed as the other bears enthusiastically try to integrate him. They run around the stream catching fish, an activity Kinai used to do with his brothers again drawing out a similarity between the humans and the natural world. And then the dusk settles in and the bears quiet down and tell each other interesting stories they have experienced. This, of course, is one of the most pivotal moments of the movie. Here's when the actual change occurs. It's time for Koda to tell a story. Koda speaks of the time he was out and about with his mother until... Out of the trees jumps the hunter! <sighs> She couldn't hold her breath any longer before POW! This is the moment when everything falls into place and Kinai realizes his mistake. The scene sends goosebumps down my spine no matter how many times I watch it. There is no way back. Kinai cannot fix what he did. He runs away chased by his own guilt and deep sense of remorse. When Koda finds him, Kinai knows that he has to admit what he's done. And you can tell something has changed. The boy in the beginning of the movie wouldn't admit to something as Timbo was failing to tie a basket. And here he is telling Koda. I did something very wrong. After learning the truth, Koda feels broken. He's sad and in denial and runs away. One of the many aspects of Brother Bear that I adore is the nuance. We know that Koda's hurt will probably never go away. And it would have been so much easier if Kinai was a one-dimensional hunter villain. But what does one do when presented with the complexities of human nature? What do you do when you love the person who hurt you and see them haunted by guilt? Do you let go of your grudge and embrace them for the changed person they are? Or do you decide to never forgive? Of course, this is a question that has so many answers depending on the situation. There is no one right answer that fits all. But Brother Bear being, in my opinion, somewhat of an idealistic mythological story aimed to teach, shows Koda forgiving Kinai, for he is his brother and he saw his remorse being true. I know that all of you may have different familial backgrounds and this wouldn't ring true to each and every one of you, but in my personal experience, having a little bro, I can relate that no matter how 
different I am from him and no matter what issues may arise between us from time to time, he will always be my little brother and we can always rely on each other. It's a beautiful feeling to experience and Koro knows that. That's why he decides to find Kinai and help him to the end of his journey. And so, in the final part of the movie, we go back to the mountain. There, where it all started. We see Tanahi chasing after Kinai once more, in a last desperate attempt to fulfill Kinai's last wish and give him the apology he wishes he did while Kinai was still with him. The situation is getting more and more intense, Tanahi is angry, then Koro shows up trying to help Kinai and then... <laughs> A bear turning into a human, winter melting into spring. This is it. Our hero has reached the end of his journey. But Kinai knows there is no turning back. He's no longer the carefree, caribou milking boy we met in the beginning of the movie. And so he decides to take responsibility for what he's done and continue his life as a bear, taking care of his little brother and becoming a man through his understanding and care for the other. I think I finally found an answer to my question. Why do I love this movie so much? Let me tell you a story. A couple of years ago, my family and I visited a particular cave in my country that is known for its beautiful prehistoric paintings. For the most part, the cave is very well lit and you can see the traces of those who were here before us. Religious ceremonies, hunting scenes, deities. But there, at the very end of the cave, there was a chamber that was closed off to the public. I had separated from the group and I just kind of felt a pull towards that place. Of course, I didn't enter, but I could take a peek inside. And there... I felt it, away from the artificial lights, away from the noise, it was just me engulfed by the chilling dampness of the stone, trying to make out shapes in the darkness. All this time I had been looking at people's lives painted on the cave walls, but here in the darkness I felt them. They had been here thousands of years ago trying to make sense of the darkness and understand the meaning behind it all, just like I was in this moment. Whenever I watch Brother Bear, I am reminded of this very feeling. I don't know, is it the music, the visuals, or the archetypal story? Maybe it's all of it combined, but I get this sense of comfort. A reminder of our shared experience as humans. Humans who aren't one-dimensional villains. Humans who have ego, who make mistakes and who regret. Humans who hate and forgive. Humans who want to give love and be loved but don't always know how to. And in the end of it all, there is the flickering hope that no matter how far we've gone astray, until our last breath, we have the ability to change. Hey everyone! If you're hearing this, then it means that you probably reached till the end of this video. And for that, I am eternally grateful. Hope you all have a lovely day. And I'll catch you in the next one, okay?